Well, welcome again. It's snowing and 25 degrees outside. Monday it was 70 and sunny. That could only mean it's Wednesday in Kansas City. So welcome, welcome to another One Million Cups. Uh, and seriously, thank you guys for uh, making it out. It's kind of treacherous out there. Um, you know, I know I was sliding up the roads unexpectedly on the way in. Uh, anybody first time? One Million Cups attendees, did you choose today to come here for the first time? <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, for those of you that haven't been to One Million Cups before, kind of run you through how this works. Each and every week, we have two local startup uh, businesses, or in this case, um, at least one nonprofit, uh, who come and tell us, give us a six minute presentation about who they are and what they do. And then we pepper them with 20 minutes of questions right after that. No softballs either. They've got to be really hard, difficult questions to answer. That's not true. You can throw up softballs too. Um, so today we've got uh, kind of two very interesting startups kind of working in the intersection of nonprofits and technology. Uh, so we'll be getting to those here shortly. Uh, just a couple of the housekeeping uh, typical stuff. Uh, if you're in the back, lounging in the coffee area, please uh, do um, give us our, our presenters their, your full attention and no yammering back there. Uh, secondly, all our paper coffee cups, please do clean up after yourself. Kaufman is nice enough to uh, let us continue to use their space week after week and uh, we want to continue to be invited back. So uh, clean up after yourselves. And I guess uh, if we're all seated, uh, Nate, did you want to lead us in calisthenics this week? Where, where did you go? All right. He said he wasn't feeling it with enough energy today, so he needs some calisthenics, but I guess not. So, All right. Well, let's get this thing started. Our very first presenter this morning is Connecting for Good uh, and Michael LaMotta. This is um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting startup nonprofit, um, and they're working in a space that's really very necessary um, or, or really uh, need some uh, need some important work. Um, the digital divide is uh, something that uh, I think uh, with Google coming on board has really been heightened. Uh, the awareness has been heightened here in Kansas City, and uh, Michael Lamada and Connecting for Good are right there working in the forefront of making sure that everybody has access to high technology communications and bandwidth here in the KC Metro. So please do welcome Michael Lamada. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I was just talking with Mike earlier about the fact that I'm probably could be considered a serial entrepreneur in, in the nonprofit sense. I've actually been involved directly or um, consulting wise with over 20 nonprofit startups. And you know, it's kind of, you know, you're my people in that regard because it, it's kind of a similar thing. You have a great idea. You've got to bootstrap it until you have a fundable program, and that's where we're at right now with Connecting for Good. Start off with our values this morning, because, you know, like any business, your values are what drive your decision making process. And our first value is basically our core belief that it, internet connectivity equals opportunity. We know we live in a digital age. We know that tens of thousands of people in this city are shut out of it. Um, secondly, we know that education is the number one thing that lifts people from poverty. However, without the internet, it's impossible. And we believe that in-home access really should be considered an essential modern utility, not that much different than phone service, electricity, or running water. You know, sometimes when people look, think about reaching under-resourced, low-income folks, they build centers where they have to go and congregate around a bank of computers. But if you're a single mom living in a public housing project with two little children, and you've got to walk a mile to catch a bus to the public library to wait two hours for, to use the internet for 45 minutes, I think there's a real problem. I think as Mike alluded to, KC is about to become the most wired city in America, or at least one of them, thanks to Google Fiber. 
And we like to say Google Fiber didn't cause the digital divide, but certainly it highlighted it as, you know, the super internet is coming here, but yet we have lots of people who are not going to be able to take advantage of it without intervention. So just a little snapshot, a few facts about the digital divide, and a lot of this comes from Google's own research. We know that 25% or one in four Kansas City homes don't have broadband internet. And we're talking about three to five megabit is, is a baseline for broadband. Of those who don't use the internet in Kansas City, 42% have annual household incomes of under $25,000. And a large percentage of these people live in low income housing. As you may know, there's a great program at the KCK Public School District where 6,000 laptops, really high-end MacBooks, go out to children in the high schools, yet less than a third of them go to homes with internet access. So Google Fiber will help. We're really excited that Google has made this offer of seven years of internet connectivity for $300. And we are promoting this program uh, and I'll show you how we plan to do it. In Firehoods, especially east of Truce, those that really came in last um, when the pre-registration campaign occurred. You know, Google Fiber will work for people who own their own homes, and can afford $300, or have landlords who will pay for them. They need computer equipment, and they need to be tech-savvy enough to sign up for it. As you can imagine, for some people, these are pretty high, high bars to get over. When we were involved with the pre-registration campaign, bringing neighborhoods green, we found there was two issues that are reoccurring. The first is, a lot of people said it's a good thing, but I don't own a computer and can't afford one. Others said, I'd like to be involved, but I don't know anything about the internet. I don't know how to use it. Uh, the big challenge that we're trying to tackle is the issue of low-income housing. And we're talking about tens of thousands of families in the city. Um, one of the issues, of course, is that Google Fiber requires a $300 construction fee for each unit in multifamily dwellings. People on public assistance can't pay for it. The folks who own Section 8 housing and managing them, as well as the public housing authorities, will not do that either. But we've found that owners and managers of these facilities are open to other ways of bringing connectivity to their properties. So we have basically a three-pronged solution, the three things, the elements that are necessary for a low-income family to connect to the internet. The fourth is we're, first is we're doing affordable broadband internet connectivity. Secondly, providing inexpensive refurbished computer equipment. And thirdly, doing what we call digital life skills training. Someone asked me, what does this mean? I said, well, it means learning how to do stuff you do every day, except online cheaper and faster. And a lot of us, and I've been doing this for years, so we don't really think about it, the fact that we have thousands of people in this community who can't even get online. So refurbished computers, we've started collecting hundreds right now of refurbished computers. And we'll take just about anything but CRT monitors. We also are developing a compu mobile computing lab. Our plan is to partner with libraries, community centers, other groups where we can get a connection uh, in the fiber hoods. And we're offering these, the complete internet ready computer systems for people who do the training for 50 bucks. We're looking at affordable connectivity, and the way we're doing that is wireless. Uh, we're bringing a bandwidth to public housing, low-income housing, and then creating giant hotspots. Uh, also doing the digital lit literacy training at the facilities. Just on the first of this month, we op opened a uh, um, computer um, refurbishing center and learning lab at 1622 Westport Road. Just really quickly, on the 14th of December of last year, we brought free Wi-Fi to Rosedale Ridge, 
168 unit, seven building, section eight complex in KCK. Before we got there, we found that 80% of the units had no in-home access. Main reason, well, they can't afford it. Family income averages at $10,000 a year. Another reason, of course, no computers. And we found that only one teenager with a KCK issued laptop could connect at home. What have we done in even just the last two months or six weeks? First day we announced Wi-Fi was coming to Rosedale Ridge, over 20 residents signed up to be part of the life skills classes and pay 50 bucks for a PC. In the past month at Rosedale Ridge, we've had over 50 participants in the digital life skills training. Nearly every one of them was a single mom with children in her 20s. I think a lot of times when we think of public housing, of course we think of older people who make up about half of it, but the rest of them are young women with young children. They're the ones who are shut out. They're the ones who represent the biggest piece of this digital divide. And we've seen over 400 devices connect to our network. Half of them are smartphones. And of course, the benefit of that is the fact that if I have a limited minute plan and I can talk over Wi-Fi, I'm not burning up my minutes. And if I'm living on a lim limited income, that will make a big difference in my life. And we've already cracked 21 KCK-issued laptops being used daily at Rosedale Ridge. We're also involved with you know, supporting Rosedale Ridge. We're actually right now in nearly the develop the installation stage of two more projects in serious talks with five others, and we continue to collect PCs and uh, develop our Westport Training Center. So how you can be involved? The first is donate good use PCs. We're especially looking for laptops. Volunteer. We need people who are digital life skill trainers and involved with computer refurbishing. Tell your friends, especially ones that you know might share our passion. You can get connected online. You can see our website and our Twitter account at Connecting KC. And finally, consider investing. Uh, you know, like any nonprofit, we need money to function. Thank you very much, Michael. All right, since we've got a little smaller group, we've got our two mics, mics up in the front. So if we can, with your questions, if you can try to head up to the front, or if not, we'll try to get out to you with your questions, which are starting now. When will a schedule be published of classes? And how can we find out when to come to teach them? All right, well, we are actually have a need for volunteers right now every Saturday morning at Rosedale Ridge. So if you want to get involved, we can put you to work this Saturday. Uh, what's that? Uh, if you need a ride, let us know. We'll get you over there. Um, it's at Rosedale Ridge, their community center. And of course, as you know, the thing that uh, the Google rollout is kind of really important, and that is that you know we're about six months away from the uh, east of Truce neighborhoods and some of the other ones in KCK from really getting installed, because uh, they were the ones we had to work really hard to turn green. So we have a, this little window of time to get ourselves organized and collect enough equipment to make a difference in those fiberhoods. Um, I'm curious, I had read an article in the pitch about low-income neighborhoods uh, trying to do this Wi-Fi type concept, and last I had read, Google was kind of like adamantly against it. Are you guys working with Google? Have you bridged that gap? Well, all I can say is Google's plan is fiber to the home, and this doesn't fit. Michael, this is uh, uh, this program is something that I really believe in. I worked really hard on the East of Truce line, knocking doors to, to get fiber out there. But um, I, I heard a lot of oohs when they when he threw the twenty five percent three to five megabit number out there. It's actually closer to one point five. 
Um, AT&T will not upgrade their lines, and uh, Time Warner Cable also cannot even offer cable internet over 1.5 in those areas. Um, and, uh, and as far as our students go and stuff like that, it's very important. The other problem that we have out there is getting the word out. What are you guys' plans, not just here, getting the word out to the people in this group, but <coughs> what, what's the plan to bridge the gap of getting information about what you guys are doing out there to the neighborhoods so that they know what's going on? Because when I start talking to people about this kind of stuff, they don't know about connecting for good. They don't know that those programs are available out there. Good, thank you. Well, let me say that one of the things that we're doing, and we, we kind of accidentally became our own ISP, is we began looking for solutions that would make sense and not cost a lot of money. Um, we have adopted a wireless strategy, kind of what we might call air fiber. But right now, the Rosedale Ridge bandwidth is coming from the 27th floor of Oak Tower at 11th and Oak downtown. We're broadcasting it basically four miles to a dish at Rosedale Ridge. And um, it's very economical. We're getting true broadband. And um, some of the East of Troost areas, that may be the solution. We're not really trying ourselves to any provider, including ourselves. But um, we're going to try to find what's most economical, what makes most sense for everybody. Can you um, describe to me a little bit about what were the circumstances that kind of brought all of this together? Um, obviously, Google coming to town kind of brought, like you said, kind of highlighted the, dis the discussion. And I know here at the Kauffman Foundation, we kind of talked about the digital divide and trying to understand that. But for you, I mean, what were the things that really brought all of this together, um, even your past experience that kind of led you to this point? That's a great question. Well, actually, I've been involved in working with the underprivileged or training people to work with the underprivileged for 30 years. Um, I started and ran a drug treatment center in Michigan for 10 years uh, that was geared to homeless people. I spent 17 years as director of an association of um, homeless providers like City Union Mission. And I also started an online college that trains people in addiction studies, non nonprofit management, and urban outreach. So my passion has always been the people most folks forget about. Uh, because I know one thing is true, and that is um, some of the great minds of this city may be people living in public housing right now. And there's, you know, when we first went to Rosedale Ridge, we saw kind of a phenomenon, what was almost like, you know, the little kid, you know, with his, his nose pressed up against the glass, looking at, you know, all the presents in the window at Christmas time. Uh, a lot of the people that we talked to over there knew what they could do online, knew about the possibilities, but couldn't get past that window pane. They, they were outside looking in. And I just feel like we don't want to make, you know, if, if Google's 100 times faster, 100 times the possibilities, we don't want to make the digital divide 100 times bigger by not making sure people can get online. I mean, I've been an educator for many years. I know education lifts people from poverty, but it's not going to happen if you can't get online. Michael, we've got a question for back here in the back. Yes. Um, Bill Gates has a program where he's given netbooks to Africa. Do you think netbooks are a more viable technology to fit the financial situation, or even, rather than connecting people, maybe having networks within the neighborhood where they could get Wi-Fi, rather than everyone having their own uh, connection at home. Well, yeah, that's kind of our, our outlook. I mean, the good news is that we're in an age of cloud computing. Today, if you have a mouse, a keyboard, and a monitor, you can do a million different things. And I think uh, what we're doing basically with um, the laptops that we're receiving is we're using open source uh, and we're equipping people to make kind of, you might say, glorified network books out of old computers. Because today the storage and even the speed of the processor is not as important as being able to disconnect. So, yeah, I mean, the, the problem, of course, is, um, you know, a lot of um, computers are being ground up 
and dismantled. And I, I heard that you can get $12 you know, for the basic pieces of a computer. But we say if you can take that computer and turn it around, it, you know, it could be the next Bill Gates in a public housing project who gets a hold of it. Uh, Michael. Yeah, so, um, how are you? Hey. Um, <laughs> so, most startups um, that we see kind of come through One Million Cups are uh, for profit companies, and they define success differently, whether that be a uh, certain amount of revenue, users, what have you. Um, but how do you define success in a, in a non profit startup uh, for you guys? Um, you know, what, what does that what is that point for you? Yeah, well, I think uh, Peter Drucker said it best. You know, he said the, the measure of success for a nonprofit is the amount of services you provide. And for us, I mean, our first measure of success is how many people can we get on Google Fiber's seven years for $300 plan who would not have been able to without our intervention? Um, secondly, how many people can we get wired up who really for whom Google Fiber is out of reach. I mean, we managed with one installation at Rosedale Ridge that took us about three days to suddenly put 400 people online. So we're, you know, we're thinking um, Wi-Fi is definitely you know, one way to, to bring larger numbers quicker. Michael, we've got one question over here and then gentleman up at the front. Okay. I know tons of people that have uh, computer equipment sitting in their basement, and the only way they know how to get rid of it is just taking it to Best Buy and they recycle it somehow, but they don't know what else to do with it. Um, do you have any plans to have like different places to take it around town, um, more than one spot, um, so help people know how to get rid of it? Yeah, I think we've, we've talked to some groups about doing actual drives for us, where they would actually set up in a location. You know, the social media club did that for us and collected about 50 PCs last November, and that was really a great kickstart for us. So yeah, if you want, know anybody that wants to sponsor something like that, we'll work with you. That may, oops, excuse me, that may fit into what my questions. First question is, what have you seen so far in terms of community? So you're talking about taking the internet and making it available to specific units in an apartment complex. But what happens with the training and the like if there's, let's say, a common area within an apartment complex? And do you have a dynamic that happens if everyone gets together and learns together? Yeah, exactly. That's what we're doing. There's a community center where there is a computer lab set up at Rosedale Ridge. And we've been doing this uh, training for about five weeks right now. And as I said, we've reached about 50 people. Uh, our next project is going to be a high-rise senior center uh, we will set up a similar thing and offer the same deal of, of digital literacy training, $50 computers. And we have another very large project that's a few weeks down the road that we'll do the same thing with. So, uh, you know, again, bringing bandwidth doesn't mean a lot if you don't have a computer. Having a computer doesn't mean a lot if you don't know how to use it. So we're trying to bring our three-pronged pro process together. And that's kind of, you know, our three colors of our ring are uh, affordable access, equipment, and training. Next question is, what can we do to accelerate what you're doing? Well, actually, you know, we're looking for investors, number one, but we're also looking for advocates. Um, as someone shared earlier, we're, we're still very new, and so we're looking for people just to help us share their, with their friends and let people know who we are and what we're trying to do. I know as we get closer to the fall, when the fiber hoods are going, in, these subtruths are being installed, we plan to do some actual PR marketing type stuff, probably some radio ads, TV, that kind of thing. Final question. Um, so the kids that have these computers in the schools, is there any plan to go to an after school program and train those kids? Well, I think that, you know, At the, the, school. the libraries and, and the, you know, the school districts themselves are doing a pretty good job when they're there. You know, I heard a story a while back about the police that went by one of the school, KCK schools and they saw a whole bunch of kids sitting outside and a whole bunch of cars parked around the school. 
And the, the police officer called the principal and said, hey, I think you better get down here. I think there's trouble down here. You better check it out. Well, when they got there, they found out that there was a whole bunch of kids trying to do their homework by picking up the Wi-Fi from inside the school. <laughs> There are a lot of neighborhoods where kids shouldn't be out that late. And so that's why we are committed absolutely to in-home access and to getting it as affordable and as quickly as possible. Um, I just know already the people from Rosedale Ridge. If you get to our website, connectingforgood.org, you'll see the 41 News story about Rosedale Ridge. And they talk with one of the residents there. And um, it's revolutionary. I mean, we, what we take for granted will transform lives. And with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. Sorry. That was wonderful. All right. Along the middle row should have been our announcements for today. If those haven't been passed down to everyone, if you would start shuffling those through. And follow along with me real quick. All right, big news here. Trelly has a Kickstarter going on right now. We want to highlight that. Guys, when you have stuff going on in the community, we've been getting a lot of contact and people wanting to make announcements. How do we get involved and how do we get the word out? Guys, we want to help everybody get the word out as much as we can. And uh, Trelly is about 70% funded right now on their Kickstarter. So if you head out there, we've got links inside this bulletin for them to get you connected with um, that project. If you remember, uh, they presented back, I think, around September. And uh, really great project. So be sure to give them some attention, some love. Go watch the video they have up on their um, Kickstarter. Also, guys, we're looking for a content manager. We've got so much stuff going on, some help to make our announcements, help connect the community. So if you guys are interested in being part of this team and helping Kansas City's One Million Cups, um, shoot us an email, send us a Twitter message, anything, get in touch with us because we want to know um, who you are and we'd love to get you connected and get uh, more activity going on. Next, we have Cameron Cushman. He's got an announcement for us. Three announcements, actually. One is we'd bugged you guys previously. It didn't make the list, but we'd bugged you guys previously about a survey that we were doing of all the startups, all the companies in Kansas City, particularly uh, high-tech companies. Uh, that survey has been going for a couple of months now. We launched it during GEW, actually. But it closes Friday. So this is really, really, really your last chance. So kaufman.org slash KC Tech Survey. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Are any researchers in the room? Do you have to be a registered company? I don't know. We'll, we'll answer that later. Kaufman.org slash KC Tech Survey. It ends Friday. Two other quick announcements. I really just want to uh, highlight a couple of the things that are already on the announcement page. First off, this Friday, 1.30, Union Station, in the Extreme screen, which if you haven't seen is pretty amazing. It's like five stories tall IMAX screen. Uh, we're going to be having an announcement about the digital sandbox. And they're going to announce the director. They're going to announce the application process. Governor Nixon will be there. It's going to be a really big deal. I know a lot of you in the room have already been involved with this. So please come out and, and hear the news. Uh, but most importantly, watch Twitter, watch Facebook, check out KC SourceLink's website um, after this to find out more details about how you can get involved and how you can apply. It's going to be a really uh, neat initiative for Kansas City. And we'll have them back in the next few weeks uh, to tell us more about that. Um, the third thing is uh, the Missouri Technology Corporation has their next round of uh, uh, ap their next application round closes next Tuesday at 5 p.m. I was with the director last week and he said we we have a hard time getting really good applications out of Kansas City and I want to change that so there's up to three million dollars uh, available in three different buckets. Go to the website. I just tweeted it out. The website, I believe, is on your flyer. And uh, let's try to change that. Uh, if you miss this deadline, and by the way, it is a firm deadline. He said literally 5 PM, if it's not on our desk, uh, you will not be considered. So if you have to drive to Jefferson City and turn it in, you have to drive to Jefferson City and turn it in. Um, but there will also be uh, new rounds being announced in March and new deadlines coming up. So if you miss this one, take a look, see if it's right for your startup and then uh, go from there. The other thing is you do have to, this is a Missouri state funded program, so you do have to be based in Missouri in order to qualify. But let's get some good Kansas City applications out there. Thanks everybody. Awesome.
We have one more announcement from Diana. Hello, everybody. Um, one more thing on your uh, announcement sheet is uh, the Lean Startup Machine that's coming to Kansas City. It'll be the weekend of February 22nd through 24th. This is a weekend event, so it goes from Friday to Sunday, and it's <clears throat> a great event to teach you about how lean startup work and how to figure out if you have a good idea and how to validate it with customers. Nobody builds anything. All you go out, all you do is you go out into the real world and see who can raise the most amount of money from real customers, from ideas that you make up on Friday evening. So it's a really exciting event where you're going to learn how to figure out if you have good ideas and whether the market's responding to them. There's a link on this worksheet. All you have to do to get a free ticket to the event <clears throat> is go to the link and fill out a short questionnaire. Um, and then the top applications are going to get free tickets. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Guys, thanks for showing up today. Like getting out with the snow. Round of applause for everybody in the room. And thank you everybody that's listening and watching on the web stream, checking in, that's great. Um, we've got Dale Knoop here with uh, Raise Mobile, who is at the intersection of uh, non for profit and also technology. So we're really looking forward to his presentation and the work that they're doing in that space. Yeah, you can give him a round of applause to get him off. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up. It's kind of treacherous out there on Ward Parkway. So uh, I came that way. Some of you didn't come that way. And I'm learning how to get down here more and more. Thanks to the One Million Cups guys for uh, having us here. Um, I am the CEO of Raise Mobile. We are a uh, Overland Park business. Um, I've got uh, two other people helping with business. David Good over here. Raise your hand, David. And Lance is somewhere over there. There's Lance. Lance helps me with operations. David is in charge of all marketing for our company. Uh, we are hiring. We're trying to find a national salesperson to help us with large nonprofit clients. Uh, we are interviewing a couple candidates, but we like meeting new people and, and uh, seeing where there's a good fit. We are angel funded. Uh, we've raised a little bit over $1.1 million uh, here in this area. Uh, we have a success-based business model aimed at mobile supporter engagement and fundraising. We handle both nonprofit and political clients. Uh, we've started to develop some very uh, interesting things for uh, a particular segment of the political space, something that's not happening um, right now for them in a, in a mobile uh, way. Uh, it's a PAC based, so political action committee based. And I know that's sometimes a dirty word to say PAC, but uh, we, we have a product that we'll be rolling out probably end of this quarter uh, that should be pretty revolutionary for their business. Uh, my background, I used to be the TV guy at Sprint. So this is me in 2005 after Sprint won an Emmy for delivering live TV to cell phones. Uh, I launched Moby TV in 2003. In less than a year, Moby TV was producing $36 million in annual revenue for Sprint. We were considered to be the 10th largest cable operator in the United States, and we did that in less than a year. Um, quick tip, if you ever go to a party and you see Ben Affleck there, stay away from the dip. He's a double dipper. <laughs> what do we believe? We believe, as we talked about here, that at the intersection of mobile and social is supporter engagement, education, and fundraising. And at that intersection lies the power to change the world. I know a lot of entrepreneurs say that, that they just want to do this or they just want to do that. Well, we we've, we've, uh, are crazy enough and, and bold enough to say that we're trying to change the world. And uh, there'll be more about that. The presentation from here is more focused on the political or the uh, nonprofit space, and it's going to be very interactive. So uh, it's a, oh, I'll show you here in a second. All right, so when you guys showed up this morning, you didn't think there was going to be an inquisition, did you? Nobody expects the inquisition. That's exactly right. What we're going to do is we're going to ask a series of questions. These are really, really easy questions. Raise your hand, answer the question, win a prize. What is the prize? It's a hat. You have the lovely Lauren and the equally lovely Leah modeling the hats here. So with that, we begin the Inquisition. In 2012, how big was the individual giving market for nonprofits? Anyone? Who said B? You're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Come on. Pick the big number. C. Who said C, Lance? Give, give those people hats. It's C. It's 2% of GDP. 
but it's in decline. Now, why would it be in decline? Could it be that everybody's starting to access the internet on their PC or their mobile phone? How much individual giving goes through direct mail? There's the <clears throat> average postal worker over there. Who said C? Give that man a hat. 75%, 75% of a 2% of GDP business goes through that guy right there. Writing out checks, handing them to him, somebody opens the check, enters it into a database. The only channel that's growing right now is online. Direct mail is in decline. Why? We know people that don't have checking accounts. Which of these is the mobile engagement and fundraising platform of today? Steve, exactly, give that man a hat. Steve, there was another one over here. Mobile technologies are supposed to grow explosively and we're starting to see hints of that. More and more nonprofits that we talk to go, we need to go mobile, so what are we gonna do? Which of these things did Graham Moore at the Salvation Army not say? And to the bottom. We're all about saving furry animals. He said, someday it'll be as easy as giving on iTunes. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants easy. If you're on a mobile phone and it takes forever, how many people have scanned a QR code and they point you to a PC site and you go, why are you doing this? Our sites render quickly. We have a donation process that takes literally 20 seconds to make completely. When your donation is made, 100% of the funds go to the nonprofit. You get a thank you email right away. They know exactly who you are. We pass them information. It's important for these sites to render quickly. We have a wide variety of templates. All of these templates are in use today by our clients. If you are relying on your PC site today as a nonprofit, studies have shown, and who likes to pinch and swipe and pinch and swipe, and then you find what you're looking for, and then you're waiting again and again and again. I learned when I was doing TV, people want information in a minute. We live in a snack-based society. You can't have an experience that takes five minutes to even get to the point where you think you're going to be able to complete the transaction. We've got responsive design, so this is what a site looks like on a tablet, and everybody loves the puppy. So when you think of mobile fundraising, what, what do you think of? Who said B? Just, that's just somebody being smart. It's C. You go to a nonprofit, and I get calls all the time. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to get set up with text to give. Um, we don't do that. And they go, oh. And I go, do you want to hear some dark, dirty secrets about text to give? And they go, yeah. Well, you're not going to find out who the donor is. So there's no connection at all. You can't thank the donor. How do you say thank you to somebody that you don't know? You're going to wait a long time for your money. You get a low pledge close rate. We're talking single digit pledge close rate. So between the time that somebody says text Sandy to a short code and it hits the carrier bill, the carrier then says, you know, collect. I want to collect the money. And the person calls up and says, well, who's this Acme Corporation? Because we've all had stuff stuck on our bill and we go, what is this for? And it comes off the bill. The carriers want you off the phone if you call in, in case you haven't noticed. It's expensive. It's capped at $10 a donation, $50 a cycle. It's not open to everyone. You have to be making $500,000 a year as a nonprofit to even qualify for text to give 67% of the nonprofits in Kansas City, there's roughly 8,700 nonprofits in Kansas City, 67% of them operate on less than $25,000 annually. Text to give, not an option. Shared short codes, if you opt out of somebody's short code, or somebody says, I want to take this short code over, as it happened to one of our current customers that had a bunch of collateral in the marketplace, their, their provider called up and says, you can't use that anymore, we're shutting it down. I'm like, uh, what? And it's carrier controlled. I, I, I use Sprint, um, yeah, enough about that. What is the, the number one reason donors drift away? They feel like they are treated like an A blank M. What's the question mark? Anyone? Who said T? T, exactly. They feel like they're treated like an ATM. What does text to give do? It treats you like an ATM. Here's the money. 
They turn you upside down, shake the money out of you, thank you, next. That's not what millennials want. Millennials want a connection to the nonprofits that they care about so that they can see what's going on with their money. They want to be engaged. They want to volunteer. They want their favorite charities to use digital media. If you are not using digital media to the fullest extent, you are missing a huge opportunity. Causes feel like they are facing a donor. Cliff. We're, everybody's facing cliffs these days. Fiscal cliff, 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 cliff. So, hat up here. Where? Who said C? No one? Just hand some hats out. Yeah, just hand some hats out. They feel like they're facing a cliff. I, I've met with them, and they are scared stiff. They get, well, what does it cost for a, a mobile site? 30 grand. Well, what if I make an app? Steve Jobs won't let you, well, Steve. <laughs> Tim Cook won't let you into the app store. They don't want fundraising applications. It's expensive to make. And if the first thing you do when you go to an event is they say, download my application, that's not the first thing you want them to do. So for us, we get inspired by people that say things like this. And this inspires David, Lance, and I every day. What are we doing to help these people? They need to be able to survive and thrive in our mobile-centric world, and there are few opportunities open to them to do that. So that's what we built Raise Mobile for. How can you help us? Tell a cause you love to, to check us out. We don't really go out and sell. We talk to our customers, and we paint a picture of, yeah, you can do this. This is easy to do. There's a nonprofit that's on our platform right now, and she said the hardest thing that, that about getting set up, Dale, was finding my Twitter handle. I'm like, well, that's, that's what we want to hear. Here's our particulars. And if you want to see it in action, text Stop Hunger to that phone number right now, and I encourage you to make a donation. I don't see anybody taking out their phones. Come on. These guys uh, feed uh, developing countries, kids in developing countries. They take the meals to the schools, and uh, the kids show up and they eat. And uh, unfortunately, uh, world hunger kills 25,000 people a day. So we all ate this morning. That's it. Thank you. Questions? I've got a question while people get up to mics and stuff. Um, what's the process like for a business to, or for a non for profit to connect with you and get started on your program? You just go to our website and create an account, start building your site, and uh, we help you connect your donate button to your uh, merchant account or PayPal account. And uh, that's it. We, we uh, set up uh, Arts KC uh, in an afternoon last week. They came through really, really fast. So it's really, um, kind of up to you. If you've got all the pieces that you need, uh, there's a banking piece that you need from the bank with your merchant account information on it, but it's really easy to get started. And uh, like I said, I've had so many people say, you know, the hardest part about it was finding this or doing that, and it wasn't anything really to do with us. It was them finding their finance person and saying, I need this, and they go, why do you need that? So. How do you make money? Uh, we charge $29 a month for our platform. We don't have a contract. And we have a donation processing fee. Um, on the first uh, $1,000 process, it's 5.9%. Then in any given month, uh, beyond the $1,000, it drops down to 3.9. So it's kind of a success-based business model. And uh, we've had a lot of people say, that's it. You know, They're expecting the usual sale, because a lot of nonprofits, uh, they feel like they get solutions that are overpriced and underperform. And we're trying to kind of flip that over and the reason we don't have a contract is I don't like contracts myself, having a cell phone contractor or, or contracts like that that kind of lock me in. Um, we don't really feel like doing that to these people. Again, they're very, very concerned about the future and the fact that they have no presence whatsoever in front of key demographic groups. So we're trying to help them go tap into that. Um, I met with uh, a local nonprofit and I said, so describe your average donor. And they go, it's a 60-year-old white guy. And I go, are you worried about that? They go, no, they write big checks. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm sure GM wasn't worried about Oldsmobile up until the point nobody stopped buying. <laughs> they stopped buying Oldsmobiles. I'm like, oh, guess what? They don't show up in the showroom anymore. So 
people will give. I mean, if it takes 20 seconds to give, I gave right before the end of the year, I gave to three nonprofits in less than a minute and it was done. They had all my money and I had my receipts. Who wouldn't do that? It's as easy as buying a song and that's what the millennials and the younger people, and even people like me, I'm not a millennial, I'm, I'm a, uh, a baby boomer. Um, I want that, I want ease of giving. I don't wanna have to go find my checkbook, I don't wanna have to go find an envelope, a stamp, a return address, forget it. Just give me 20 seconds and I'll do it right now. Yeah, if the, if the cause is, is using their merchant account, then you do have to fill out the credit card form. For me, the first time I did it, it was about 100 characters all in, so it's less than a tweet. And then at the end of the process for a first time donor, we say, would you like to create a PIN to store your information securely, tokenized solution, PCI compliant, all that good stuff. If you do that, every time you come back and donate to any cause using Raise Mobile, we just ask you to put your PIN in. So that's what gets you to the, the, the optimal experience. And you only have to fill the form out once if you do that. So just doing it once. It's, if you've been following anything that's been going on in the political space, there's been a lot of talk right now about the Obama campaign using, excuse me, quick donate. It's the same thing. Stored credentials applied over and over and over again. And for them, it was just for the Obama campaign. But I'm hearing things that they're going to expand that right down to the local level. And uh, that's certainly something that we've had discussions with certain political parties that can't seem to figure out where the sun shines. And uh, so it's, it's really easy. Any other questions? Um, have you talked to anyone at Douala uh, yeah. for accepting their payment system? Yeah, we have. Awesome. I got another one if you guys don't. People that are giving to Kickstarter are getting really used to getting rewards back for donating. And it's not always nonprofits, I know, but even you know, public television, people are at least used to their tote bags. I know it's not a trivial change, but what do you think about sort of that get something in return? That's up to the cause, right? So we certainly provide them enough information that they could start to hand out goods. Um, but there is a, a disclaimer that typically gets put on the receipt that says no goods or services are received in exchange for this donation. So the IRS has become very, very uh, anal <laughs> about having that on a receipt. So it's really up to the cause. And our platform allows them to have that on the receipt or not have that on the receipt. And we've encouraged some people to say, if you give $100 by this Friday, you get a t-shirt or you get a this or you get a that. So it's really up to them. We're just creating a platform that they can create their presence and seamlessly integrate it into everything they're, do they're doing today. And for those donors that are motivated to make a donation, they can do it quickly when the impulse hits. Mobile devices, incredibly, they're an impulse device. You take your phone out when you're bored and want to be informed. And uh, are public television stations, public radio stations, the kinds of places I can introduce you to? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually gone through the KCPT experience and um, it, it, it I, I would like to talk to them and just show them what we do. I'm not going to go in and say that I, I've got a better experience because maybe they've chosen theirs for the reason that they've chosen it. But. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Hey, um, what, what's your greatest challenge in the next six months? And um, also, um, so that's kind of the challenge side, but what's kind of been your greatest success so far? The challenges uh, for any startup are... Uh, mostly around awareness, right? Um, we've heard our message in the marketplace be well received, so we've had our message repeated back to us. We've had some nonprofits say, hey, I want to take you to the national level, or hey, we need to be able to do this. Um, once the awareness is there, the challenge then becomes dealing with uh, a board that is a 60-year-old white guy, and he carries a feature phone, and he hates QR codes, and he thinks text messaging is a fad. Um, it's getting over those hurdles. Um, the greatest success is really getting to the point where I'm speaking to all you guys, right? I mean, we are a real business. We have real customers. Uh, we, we've been able to generate angel funding. We've had our, our uh, message well received in the marketplace. We continue to refine. So this whole thing about pivoting and experimentation and things like that, we're living that 
as we speak right now. We're delivering a product feature for Arts KC in 16 days that they said I would love to have, and we just shuffled our priorities around and, and did that. So uh, getting to go help these guys survive and thrive is, is something that's very, very exciting to all of us, the three of us at Raise Mobile. Um, but there's always challenges out there. It, it's uh, anybody that's in a startup knows that you just have to keep going and keep going and uh, stay really, really focused on a core business, and, and uh, that's what we do. Do you guys have any competitors in the space or anybody that's doing something similar? I'm not sure comp competitor is even the right word. The one, yeah, the one that we really focus on is text to give because that's what occupies people's minds. Um, once they find out uh, about the dark side of text to give, they kind of give up their uh, desire to go that route. Um, Thank you for killing that, by the way. I've always thought that was a dumb idea. So. <laughs> There was a, a, a Pew Internet report done in January 2012, and they said on an appeal basis, so they interviewed people that gave to Haiti through the Haiti short code to Red Cross, and they said on an appeal basis, texting to give or filling out an online form. Texting to give was 25% of appeal, uh, filling out an online form was 24%, so to me that's a statistical dead heat. And when you're dealing with a product where you don't get your money right away, and you don't know who the people are, you're just perpetuating the ATM problem. Um, there are large players in our space. Blackbaud is a large, large player in our space. There are all the crowdfunding platforms that are out there. We're talking about a business that's $277 billion annually that's dominated by Newman. There's room for a lot of people here. And the thing that we focus on is making sure that the product does what it says it does and focus, focusing on kind of a core set of features and then just pushing the product out in the marketplace and trying to solve the, the awareness challenge. We've got some things coming up from a marketing perspective that will, that will start to do that. But um, there's some big ones out there. Uh, but uh, you know, when I was doing TV, we always used to say, you know, there's going to be somebody big come in and do TV. And, and um, you know, you've still got Microsoft that, that can't really get their mobile thing going. And RIM is hoping that they can get their mobile thing re-going. So big companies have a hard time shifting from one medium to another. And uh, we're uh, scrappy enough and crazy enough to believe that we'll be all right. I'm curious, what's your uh, average size donation? Uh, we haven't done really any analysis on that um, yet. Uh, the data set's been too small. Uh, we have had a couple clients uh, generate $1,000 donations. And, and we, uh, <clears throat> we, we stopped work and... and uh, Celebrated. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, well, I guess part of my question for that is that throughout this, you've uh, really pushed the, you know, that it's credit card based and that you can sign up, create a pin. It's simple from there on. Have you considered like a ACH option? So yeah. rather than paying out dollars, it's kind of pennies. Yeah. We started with what was being used most by the clients, both on the political side and the nonprofit side. We started with just merchant processing. Then we just rolled out PayPal. And then we've looked at Dwala and we've looked at ACH as well. We just have to be careful that we don't have um, a, a page that goes, do you want to pay with, you know, and there's yeah, eight, no, 18 <clears> different <throat> things, and some I, of them look at it and go, what's a Dwala? No, I, I definitely get that from the um, <clears throat> keeping it simple yeah. standpoint. We've also, yeah, we've also heard, too, that people like to use their credit cards because they get points. Gotcha. So the, the notion of giving sense. and the charitable deduction and then getting points for that. You might be able to do something... Um, where it's simple and almost fun, though, where like they take a picture of the check and then that signs them up for the ACH. So. Yeah, we, we've actually talked about doing that for the clients because we do ACH billing for our clients. We try to stay with the green theme, right? So we're telling you to cut down on mail. We didn't think it made sense for us to send you a paper bill. You go, here, stop using mail. Here's your bill. So we, we do ACH billing for our clients. Cool. If there, was, uh, if there was a charity that you wanted to support monthly, do you have a platform for that? Like fifty dollars a month, or you know, like if I wanted. That's to... exactly what we're rolling out for uh, Arts KC is is a recurring donation capability. So you have the ability to set that up and uh, declare whether it's. We're starting really basic because um, we, we like to iterate off of what our clients come back and say they want, and um, we just want to start with kind of a baseline of here's recurring giving, and then they'll come back and go, hey, we're hearing this, this that, and the other thing. And specific to them, they want to be able to take 
uh, their presence into businesses. So Sprint, Sprint does a lot of employee giving through their paycheck with the United Way. Um, this is more of kind of a, a, a different version of that. So yeah, we'll have that in, uh, what, 16 days? We're already uh, writing code on it right now. Hey, Dale, thanks for the hat. Nice hat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question, are there any metrics uh, collected for the donors? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We uh, capture name, address, email, donation, time of day. Um, if you gave to a particular campaign, so if you have a campaign within kind of a campaign, and then we just rolled out a feature where a donor can add a, an intention or a memorial. You know, this is for the spotted kitten I saw on your website, or this is for in memory of grandma or whatever it might be. That would also appear in your, your donor report, and you can do download those on a, a daily, monthly, hourly, weekly basis. Do you intend to collect any demographics to find, you know, to give the donor an indication of who's giving? And We're really kind of relying on the causes to do that. We, we just hand them the data and then they can use whatever means they have, whether they're using BlackBot. So we've got some clients that are using BlackBot and take our CSV reports and upload them. We've got some clients that are using Salesforce, same thing. We've got some clients that don't do anything. So they're just happy to have the money and have the connection. And uh, typically what's been happening is they'll take their uh, email and put that into their email database and start to move the transaction to email. And I'm like, we just connected with you on mobile. Why are you moving them over here? So. And uh, do the nonprofits, do they do multiple uh, campaigns? Yes. On your program? Yeah, we have, uh, so you have your, your main site, so some of the examples you saw, and then you can set up something that just takes people straight to the donation page. And that, that money can go into the same account, but it shows up as earmarked as coming from the, you know, make the snow stop campaign. We've got time for one last quick question. Hey, Dale, it seems like the, uh, the Newman problem is really the result of the call to action from the nonprofit mailing out the request. Um, in order to overcome that, they, they would then need to change their marketing platform. You know, it's uh, direct mail is an effective way for them to get the word out. You know, the response then, if you're expecting somebody to go online versus the envelope's ready in my hand, the pre-addressed right. reply slip is ready in my hand, I just have to fill out the credit card info. So um, are, are you finding that as you speak with these companies, they are looking for alternate methods of getting the word out as to what they're trying to do to alleviate this big cost where a lot of their dollars are actually going into printing, mailing, et cetera? Yeah. The there's a blog post that I've written that hasn't been published yet, and it's about the kind of the permanency of mobile. It's anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. um, when when uh, the summer was so hot, we were going to causes and going, well, if the air conditioner goes out right now, what are you going to do? Well, we'll probably call some people. Well, they're going to call rich people that they know and say, ask, you know, I need a check, right? It's the 60-year-old white guy, and he's not waiting by his phone, by the way, saying, I'm ready to call. You know, it's sort of the Batman red phone. Um, yeah, they have to change. And what we found is they typically, the nonprofits typically get kind of, I've got a live event, then I've got a direct mail drop, and then we've got a golf tournament, and then we've got a run, and then we've got a this, and that's our whole year. And what we've said is, well, why don't you have, you know, kind of the whole tell people what you're doing and not wait for those events. Live events are incredibly expensive for them. A lot of nonprofits don't even know. The average cost of a dollar raised is 20 cents. Live events are horribly expensive. Now, when you shift to the political side, they're like Mr. Krabs. I mean, they'll run down the street to chase a penny and, and feel really, really good about it. And they're not under the same kind of scrutiny that nonprofits are under, right? Nonprofits, Kanye West's charity goes through 90% of what comes in. I've met with nonprofits that say, I have to live within a board demanded 3% footprint. Right. So it takes time. Um, but the good news for us at, at Raise Mobile is, they're all coming in this direction. And the awareness thing is gonna help us kind of meet them okay. and say, hey, we're out here, this is a good solution. The other thing that's working really, really well for us is word of mouth. Um, so they go, hey, I saw your solution, I was talking to my banker, or I was talking to this guy or that guy, and I, I heard this from them, and they said we should check you out. And we just meet with them and say, let's talk about mobile. You know, what are you looking for, what are you looking to do? Great, thank you. Well, awesome. 
Well, I think that wraps it up for today. We have one last word from Adam Adriano. Next week, we've got a pretty good event coming up, so we want to give him just a second. But guys, thank you very much for coming out in the snow. Give Ray's Mobile a, a hand and uh, enjoy. So I'll keep this super quick, but a awesome event has come together very quickly. Next week will be the first ever KC Startup Crawl. It was kind of a joint effort between KCSV and Venture Fridays, Red Nova Labs, and it's grown into this crazy event. There's gonna be four buses that are on a circuit between seven startup locations in Kansas City between 4.30 and 10 o'clock next Friday night, February 8th. It'll be Red Nova, KCSV, Fiberspace, Kaufman, Office Port, Think Big, and Beta Blocks. It's awesome, it's free. We do ask, I mean, uh, Red Nova is fronting the entire bill for all the buses and everything, so if you can donate a little bit, um, the, the page is kcstartupcrawl.eventbrite.com, but it is gonna be amazing. It'll be a way for you, if you haven't seen all these other startup entities in Kansas City, a great way to see all of that in one night. Um, so KC Startup Crawl, next Friday, February 8th. It's replacing uh, Venture Friday, and a lot of you know about that. And it's free, and it's gonna be amazing. So KC Startup Crawl at eventbrite.com. Awesome, thanks. Guys, thanks again for coming, for supporting us every week, for getting out in the snow. Go meet some people and enjoy the startup scene this morning.